actually, I'm Andrew Bauman, and you are Rob Fulmer. Oh, we're starting? Yeah. I mean, Andrew Bauman. You're starting to talk like you're on a podcast. No, I'm just, I'm just outlining what we're going to talk about. I don't know. That could be, sure. that could be behind the scenes too, or it could be whatever. Anyway, Lester Jones, NBWA, and also Bart Watson um, from the Brewers Association. This was um, a recording that we're sort of encapsulating um, that was Brewbound put on in Santa Monica uh, the first week of December, I think. So we're just kind of catching up on a conference. Sometimes I'll, I'll go to things like that. Other times I won't. Um, I haven't really had it, my travel budget lately, my personal travel budget to do it. Santa Monica is expensive to stay at. I would imagine. I mean, we just I think at- it was their their uh, discount rate was like four seventy nine a night. Hotel, yeah. 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 Plus, I mean, the, Plus the tickets to the conference are not inexpensive, right. very expensive. No, and you, uh, the last time I did a conference in, I did it, uh, the uh, um, Beer Business Daily in in um, Coronado was, uh, I don't know, six years ago, maybe. Arizona is a wildly beautiful place. Brimming with over 100 brewing companies. I'm Rob Fulmer, the executive director of the Arizona Craft Brewers Guild. I'm joined by Deputy Director Andrew Bauman. Together we cover the state. Bringing you the best of what's happening at our breweries and beyond. Welcome to Arizona Beer Frontier. And we should start with uh, our, what do we do this week? And then go into the... No, I know. I was just outlining what, yeah, great. what we're going to talk about. Cool. Um, okay, we're back. <laughs> I don't, we, hey, Rob. Did we even leave, <laughs> Andrew Bauman? I don't know. I didn't leave. I sat here. All you, right. had, you had a call. So um, I was... I don't know. One one of these is going to be the cold open, and one of these is going to be the actual podcast. Sure. Why nobody needs to. Know you can that. mix them all together, like a blender. I was just explaining the last time I went to a conference was in um, Coronado, and um, you know, in, in addition to paying five hundred plus dollars a night to stay, and then like fifteen hundred or so just to be a conference goer. Right. Um, good. It's all good information. I mean. Um, they will tell you exactly what they're going to do to you. The, yeah, the, the big the big guys. They always there's no secrets. They say this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to um, kick your ass. And then you know it's you know they throw some money at it, and you know sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know it all comes down to human beings anyway. Um, uh, it, it, beyond all those expenses, you know you're paying. I recall paying like ten dollars for a Corona and twelve dollars for a Ballast Point. Something, something. The coffee is going to be. Yeah, at, at the hotel. Yeah. And you can't really go anywhere because you're on a literal island, you know, but um, um, actually, no, we did. We went to uh, Coronado Brewing Company where prices were much more in line with the rest of America at yeah. the time. This was this was years ago. This is not today where, you, yeah, you'll see a $10 pint once in a while in a place that we were going to go. Yeah. yeah but um, A $10 Corona, though. <laughs> I know. It's like you're really not. Trading, uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, but uh, in uh, other Corona news, <laughs> when we went and got barbecue, that's yeah. what Brady ordered. Oh, okay. and I was like, "What are you doing, bro?" Hey, did you are you following? Um, this is totally gonna take the whole thing off a of train of thought here. <laughs> did you see the uh, fingers article on the um, Medela, uh, the uh, yeah con- constellation, constellation guy? Um, yeah. Oh, there, there's a there's a very strange story about somebody who was very high up at um, uh, Constellation who apparently was impersonating a detective <laughs> Richard Harder. Richard Harder. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, there is some harassment to a family involved. Um, it's we'll bizarre, probably talk man. about it when there's more uh, information, but it's out there or not. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's something we need to go over. It's just pretty bizarre. It is wild. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about um, a year-end review by NBWA and Brewers Association by their chief economists. However, uh, um, 
as a show note, uh, we are postponing the uh, Craig Miller. That will be released during Christmas week because we have two holidays that go uh, the weekend, Monday, and then you're back on Tuesday. And that's just a lot for us to sort of manage. So we're going to try to get in some episodes, but this is more of a contemporaneous one. So when you hear it on Thursday, it's something we talked about on Tuesday or today is today, Wednesday. I don't even know. Today is Wednesday. Okay. See, yeah. See? Yeah. All sure? our meetings on Tuesday got kicked to Wednesday. Yeah. So this make that makes today Wednesday. So what did we do the last couple of days? We were in Flagstaff. Uh, yes, it was my son's 21st birthday. So we That's zoomed it. up to Flagstaff on Friday. Bonnie took the weekend off, headed up there. Stayed with you and Brenda. Yeah. At the uh, Guild's Northern uh, <laughs> Fortress. Complex. <laughs> we had some windows. You did a lot in. of house renovation yeah, stuff. Yeah, we did. I did a lot of not that. Yeah. I did a lot of climbing of ladders. And my legs are still mm. not right where they should be. But uh, we, mm. we we didn't really do um, anything until Saturday. We, we went out on Friday night mm -hmm. at midnight. Your son came in and... Right. Um, Dozens, dozens of his yeah, friends. Yeah, good, good turnout. It was very nice. Yeah, yeah. And um, you went you went skiing the next morning. So we were out till two in the morning, and then uh, I woke up at six fifteen to go pick the boys up to go skiing. Brady and his best friend Sam, and we went up to uh, Snowball. Opened up the back, turned on the stove, made some eggs, some sausage, made some breakfast burritos. Got everyone pumped up for the rest of the day. And they had Jägermeister, <laughs> which is what you do. Uh, then we skied, and it was great. Right. And we stopped in the afternoon, and uh, then they had Fireball. Uh, and I made ramen. It was delicious. And everyone was super happy. And then we head back down the mountain. And then... You and I, oh yeah, that was like four o'clock when the mountain closes. So then we headed back down. So we got, I got home about five thirty. Yeah, and then we had a thing at seven, but we left about six. Six. Yeah, we went to um, Wanderlust, mm -hmm. and uh, bartending was uh, Josh Merced. Yeah, who is uh, somebody we're going to talk to in the near future. He's um, geography professor at NAU. Incredibly passionate about craft beer. Right. And he has some sort of um, curricula. I think it's multiple pieces where he talks about geography and breweries and um, it has something to do with um, how you how people construct, reconstruct um, places that they know. It's, uh, it's all detailed. Uh, Brian Roth um, from um, Good Beer Hunting. There's a podcast some some time ago. Um, he touches on it a little bit, so we want to see if we can get him involved and understand more about that. So that was kind of happenstance because I've been trying to reach out to each other for a while, and I haven't been up there. Um, in fact, I, I was it was I was beginning to wonder if I would even leave the house because I had all this stuff going on. So we got to go to uh, Wanderlust, uh, talked a little bit to Josh, and um, then we went to. Mountain Top, top tap, tap Room. Or third, third anniversary. Nice. Yeah. I didn't realize that was what the thing was for, but yeah. there was a collaboration with Simple Machine Brewing Company yeah. on a beer called White Pow? Fresh, Fresh Pow. Pow. Fresh that, Pow. That was very, that was very um, NPR, uh, this Saturday Night Live. Yes. <laughs> Fresh Balls. Fresh Balls. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Sweaty Balls. <laughs> I've already done a podcast about that. I don't want to do it again. Okay. Also not with you. Okay. Um, we had some fresh pow. It's a white IPA and super nice. Right. Marshall and Valerie came to visit. Apparently they've been up there all weekend and just missed us at Brady's birthday party. That's okay. I didn't need to stay at <laughs> any later. We switched to cocktails and, um, you know, uh, we were hoping to find some place mo more mellow and chill, but it was just more. 
Oh, wow. It people, was, people stuffed into a small room. And yes. Um, that was Friday. It just, you know, like we were at the rendezvous in Money V and just seeing like, I don't know, oh. 78 glasses on the on, on a table just waiting for someone to pick them up and wash them. On Saturday, that the, stressed me out. The, uh, the Flagstaff citizens were explaining how they were sad because it was really slow that night at mm. Rendezvous and um, the Monta Vista. Yeah. So that was a really slow night. Yeah. Yikes. So uh, after we went to Mountaintop Tap Room. Right. And got to hang out and have some very nice conversations. Yeah. We moved on to Pay and Take. Yes. You have all kinds of things to say about Pay and Take. You had oh my God, it was, very happenstance It was things. really something. Go ahead, man. Like yeah. it was like, it was like uh, this is all about random coincidence for Andrew <laughs> Bellman, like in a row. Like I couldn't even keep keep up. Like <laughs> this, who is he talking to now? This guy was sitting at the bar with us, explaining how his family was one of the founding families of Chandler, Arizona, where I live, and that his though he lives in Pine Top, his sister still lives in their family historical home. A, and, home, a home where they would have a farm and sheep would be herded from show from Sholo. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I didn't hear all of it because I yeah. moved on to a different thing for a little bit. But, okay, but okay. Continue. I'm sorry, I wanted to get the sheep in there. Wow. The, yeah, I know. It's, just, it's 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 to me, it's like how big of a state we can yeah. see this, but how small it is. Right. You're walking sheep from Sholo as a on a regular annual basis. Incredible. Yeah. So so uh, he pulls up. Where the family, well, I'm asking like, where, which, which corner is it at? And I'm thinking like, what? I don't know any of these houses. So he pulls it up on a map and I said, that's my street. It's three blocks from my house. Yeah. So that was pretty crazy. Right. He, he's supposed to be in town tonight. And, and you've uh, reconstructed um, what house that is. You like, oh, that house. Oh yeah. Right. I knew exactly which house yeah. it was. It, it's not a big it's nothing odd. Like you would think an old house right. from a long time ago. Yeah, it's been reconstructed. It's been. He has a very yellow sepia tone photo on his phone of 1978 and there's nothing around it and there's sheep and there's just the house. Yeah. So very cool. And then uh, I'm it's still a county talking island at the end of my street. That's one acre. That'd be so amazing to build a brewery <laughs> on. And I've lost it after that house <laughs> since I moved into mine hey, 20 hey, years ago. Go meet up with them and <sighs> sign the papers. Yeah. So then while well, we're talking to him, some other guy comes up and says, are you Andrew Bauman? I said, yeah. He says, I'm Mark Bauman. I was asking the bartender to add another beer to my tab. And she said, what's your last name? I said, Bauman. She said, which Bauman? <laughs> that doesn't happen a lot in a bar with 10 tabs open, right? Right. Uh, so then we talked to him and his partner is in the event industry and worked a lot of events that I was with, that I was working during my catering days. Wow. Yeah. So we're also going to connect and see how that relationship might turn into something for guild events. Never know. Never know. Yeah. There aren't very many Baumans is what you were saying. I'm saying that, yeah. It's a German name. It is. And Mark is your father's name. Yes, but this gentleman was his last, his name was M-A-R-C. Allegedly. Yeah, but yes. <laughs> Maybe you have two fathers. Maybe that's your <laughs> real father. I don't think he was old enough to be <laughs> my father. Yeah, I'm just looking up the provenance of Bauman. Somewhere they tell you how many there are. Like oh. your last name. Like, In the no, great. Just like there are, you know, 70,000 Baumans or whatever. Sure. You know, but compared to uh, Smith or Chin or the, Lee. <laughs> there is another, uh, there was at one point another Andrew Bauman in the valley. Uh, oh, the, 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 the uh, pastor sex therapist? One? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> just because someone already had that name for email address with uh, Cox back in the day <laughs> in Arizona. Are you sure about this? Like, didn't we talk about you? There was another one who yeah, asked you, me to take that web. Right, a, a uh, pastor sex therapist. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's a different one. Yeah. Oh, but he's in Pennsylvania or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Good. Let's see. He could stay there. I don't need that confusion in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do you. 
Wow. So that was quite the weekend. But like, oh, then we left on. Oh. Oh the, yeah, we we left on Sunday. I don't want to. We left Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get into the whole thing. <laughs> okay. I don't want to get into Sunday. Sunday was well. A, well Sunday um, was we a went and had some delicious drive. barbecue. Yeah. And my son ordered. I ordered a lumberyard railhead red. Yeah. And it was perfect with barbecue, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, red and barbecue, perfect. And Brady ordered a Corona, and I was so disappointed. I said, "What are you doing?" And his friend He's was disappointing like, his father. That's what and his sons friend do, was right? like. What are you doing, man? And Bonnie was like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, "Oh my god, happy birthday to me!" I guess. <laughs> I walked up to the guy at the counter and I said, "It was his twenty first birthday yesterday." He thought I was done pointing that out to everyone I meet, but nope, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that was it, and then we drove back I to mean, the valley you know. and listened to a p- couple fun podcasts, and yeah, there it is. Sunday, Monday. What did we do on Monday? We drank on Monday, right? Or just was that just yesterday? Yeah, it was just yesterday. Okay, yesterday. So we got the call to share in the uh, enjoyment of a couple of collaboration beers, uh, one of which we were there for. Right. The other of which we did not get to participate, but they were both produced by Four Peaks. Uh, one was with Lumberyard. And that was the, I don't remember what these were called. Uh, that was the German pills. Okay. Was that the German? No, it was not. Just a German pills. Yeah. Pills. A hoppy German pills. Right. And then uh, the one that was made at Huss. At with Huss. the Four Peaks guys that we were. And, and, and Pedal House. Yes, and Pedal House. Yeah. It was the old folks uh, <laughs> collaboration. That's the, uh, that was, so that was meant to mimic um, so Melissa was there, Osborne, Derek. No, Melissa wasn't there. Maybe yes, maybe. she was. Oh, yeah, she was. Doc. Jeff. Uh, Jeff Huss. Andy. Andy. Um, Jim, Jim Roper. Yeah. And and the entire Huss crew. Yeah. Uh, that one is sort of a 90s, late 90s, um, uh, aggressively hopped uh, amber more. Yeah. So like in the style of, if everyone remembers Red Seal from- um, North Coast. North Coast, I think, yeah. So in that matter. So, <laughs> but but enough, um, um, there's maltiness and, and there's enough hop bitterness and flavor to sort of neutralize the, any sweetness. So, yeah. Right. So it was good. It, it was floral and you could taste hops and they used some experimental hops, I guess. Mm-hmm. And not bitterness like you would get in an IPA, but just enough bitterness to counteract any sweetness. But you right. got the malt flavors, you got the hop flavors. It was super. It was really good. Right, and um, and that, that was at the Eighth Street Brewery, and John Schmidt was there. Some of the other people we mentioned were there. Cliff got there. Yeah, uh, Cliff. And, we had lunch. Yeah, it's nice. And uh, Ken, Ken was there. So Ken Wilson from Lumberyard Brewing was there for their German Pills collab. And, and we, then, thought, we thought we were going to have to go to our legislative meeting. We thought we were at our Salt River meeting that same day, but they all got moved to, to today. Scott, yeah, Salt River got changed because of some complications with schedules. And then the legislative meeting uh, was just on the wrong day in the calendar or something. Yeah, I think it was originally set up. And then it, what made it confusing in. is I have a text stream with um, a principal of the, of the group. group who was saying, well, we'll talk about it tomorrow. And like, that's was wrong. So I got confused. It's all fixed. We're going to that later today. <laughs> we were at our Salt River meeting today. This is why I don't know what day it is. Yeah. I guess. I all of know. our Tuesday meetings moved to Wednesday. We did have another thing yesterday, which was at Angel's Trumpet Ale House. Yes. Yes. And that is the one of the uh, retirement celebrations for Chuck Knoll of Crescent Crown Distributing, formerly of Little Guy. Yeah. Distribution. There were a lot of little guy shirts in the room. Yeah. A lot yeah. of them. Our friend Leroy had one. I'm like, I'm really yeah. super jealous. He wasn't even in the industry. He was just a fan. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, that's important too. Um, uh, that, that all happened a little bit before my sort of beer consciousness. I was obviously drinking things, beers, but like I wasn't really, it really wasn't sealed that this was, a craft beer was a thing that people, Around there, and we threw around the word microbrewery once in a while, but nobody really understood what that 
truly meant? I was working at Olive and Ivy as a manager, and I got to sit down with Chuck and try a whole bunch of beers. Right. This would have been around 2003, four. Yeah. Yeah. And so Uh, that was really like. So Little Guy Distributing was a distributor that wasn't any of the larger ones. And at that time, Alliance was in the game. Um, Hensley was here, but they didn't do craft. Uh, Crescent Crown didn't have a, nobody had a craft program. Truly. Um, You know, I, uh, Alliance may have had Four Peaks at that time and Oak Creek and, they didn't have Lumberyard because it didn't exist yet. They had Beaver Street maybe, right? Um, In 2000? Yeah. 2003? Lumberyard's not as old. Like it's, I think it started oh, in 14. right, right, right. Anyway, uh, but, but there wasn't anyone really selling them as craft beer. There was no, there wasn't much of a movement. There wasn't a lot of craft consciousness among consumers. So little guys started... With some of those brands, not uh, some craft brands, but mostly Avery, a, Rogue, right, and, and, Stone, and, and also um, a smattering of Belgian beers, and that's where, you know, when you talk to Chuck, that's that's his piece of of, of the pie. Um, he, Funny he, you saw him in Belgium randomly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I knew he was going to be in the country, but I, to to zone in on the very first place I went to, then. Like he's at the first table and I walk in and shake his hand and Brenda can't even like process it. <laughs> She's like, I, I thought that was like an owner guy that you were talking to. And then I realized who it was. <laughs> yeah. That happened um, recently. But um, anyway, uh, he's retiring after, I don't know, 20. Many, many years. 20 plus years. Because mm-hmm. uh, little guy was 21 years ago, something like that. Um, and little guy got absorbed into the Crescent Crown family. Right. And as it was, it was, it was explained um, to me, uh, uh, when Crescent Crown was purchased as a brand from, um, started as a, I don't know what they purchased. Oh, they might've purchased like the Zeb Pierce assets because Zeb Pierce was the Coors distributor. I might be getting that wrong, but this would make sense because they are a Coors. Um, uh, when they bought that, the the family, um, Moffitt family, who already owned Crescent Crown in Louisiana, uh, were just st- starting out. And um, Joe Catronio, who is now the vice president over both operations, um, said, hey, uh, Bubba, Bubba Moffitt, we, we're not done yet. We have to purchase this other distributor. And that was where that happened. And um, Chuck became um, invaluable in that in that. Um, transfer of knowledge and product knowledge and, and access to those markets. That's as it was explained to me. And you know what? Um, we'll get, um, beer history is important. Yeah. We'll get, uh, we'll get, uh, a few, we'll get somebody from little guy, uh, on this podcast soon. I hope, um, hopefully before beer week, because uh, I'd like to get his thoughts. Um, it's Bruce McConnell and his son, CB McConnell and, um, start their little guy. Yeah. So we'll get their thoughts and, and how this all went. Huge supporters of everything that's been going on in the last couple of years. Um, so I'm excited to talk to them. Talk to them last night informally. And um, so we'll do that. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, there were people, there were all kinds of people who uh, worked with Chuck and who are, you know, no longer maybe with Crescent as a house or with. Uh, in beer at all. Beer and all. Yeah. Beer at all. Um, and so. I we didn't because we were in Flagstaff. We didn't get to go to the first one, which was in Cave Creek, um, at Bricks. Uh, this is the second one. Friday, there's another one at Papago. That'll be a a little bit different mix of people. So hopefully we can make that. But that's that's why maybe I'm dragging a little bit. <laughs> um, there's a lot. There was a lot of uh, um, yeah, it's a little bit of emotion. There was a lot of people to talk to. I get tired of trying to, to be to on all the time, you know, like, yeah, there was no sitting down. There was always talking, always talking, always. I sat down for like 12 seconds. Yeah. But it was fine. And then I got up. <laughs> uh, yeah. That is what happened in the last few days. Yeah. Upcoming is the Christmas holiday. 
Yeah. Doing anything fun? You said sleeping. What I understand. I'm not sleeping. <laughs> I know I said that. That's not happening. Uh, we're having a couple people over on Christmas Eve and then my parents, the kids on Christmas Day. We stay home and stay in our jammies all day. What are you drinking there, sir? Ooh, I've got the Fire Rises from Kitsune Brewing Company, which is a collaboration with Fire and Fury Brewing Company for their two-year anniversary. Talked about that last time. Um, it's a very nice 5.5% very hoppy pale ale. Great. I'm having a pineapple manga goza from Fate. This was brought to us by Adam not too long ago. Who chose not to be on the podcast for some reason. We'll have to ask him again. He has things to say, but he didn't want to. That he was doesn't only like we, committing things to know, tape. Uh, he doesn't like <laughs> committing. Committing <laughs> doesn't matter what it is. Uh, but uh, this is pineapple goza, mango goza. Um, I haven't had it yet, so oh, you, cheers. You, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, that'll wake your mouth up. Okay. That's delightful. Yeah. I uh, right. bought this, and this is my third one I've drank, so I'm oh. not surprised. It's, it's great. Good. It's very I'm gonna nice. Have to, I'm going to have to sneak a taste of it before the can is emptied. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a low-key holiday for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, Friday will be Chuck's thing. That'll probably be the the only thing I do. Um. We're going to spend some time with family. There's not going yeah, to be a lot of beer have, value. You have a lot of family in the Valley, though. Yeah, but uh, I think everyone's kind of doing their own thing a little bit more. There's not going to be a big gathering this year. There's been a lot of transition, and hmm. I mean, by that I mean people passing away in, in some of uh, my wife's husband's side. Um, my wife went through that a couple years ago. I think um, I think we're just going to kind of keep it mellow this you year. You said your wife's husband's side. My wife's sister's, sister's husband's, husband's side. side. Yes. Thank you. The one and only <clears throat> Tom, Tom Allen. Allen. Um, so. Praise be his name. <laughs> um, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the big, the meat of the uh, story today is the end of year update from the. Brewers Association and. National, National Beer, Beer Wholesalers Association. NBWA. Right. Chief Economist Bart Watson from the BA and... Lester... Lester Jones. I want to say Lester Holt, but that's not <laughs> it. <laughs> Lester Jones from the NBWA. Yeah. Uh, and I had forgotten. Man, he's a, Lester is such a great speaker. He, he just like... And I uh, forgot he hails from Austin and I was in Austin and I never even... Sorry if you're listening, Lester. It's, it's, it's not... <laughs> First of all, it's very unusual to be listening to this show. You have to type that in so that when he gets his Google alert on his own yeah. name, it comes up. He doesn't seem like a guy who Googles his own name. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, That's why he has to have a Google alert. The, yeah. the headline is what? For uh, The headline is that beer volume is down. Total alcohol volume is remaining steady. People are trading from beer to other products. And that restaurants, which had not recovered, have now fully recovered. They're not adding more taps. And that people who own breweries need to get on that hospitality train and understand you're not just making beer. You're providing experiences from the second someone comes in the door to the second they leave. And whether that's... Your beer, your food, your staff, what the entire environment of your brewery is, is key to success. You can't just make beer and have that be enough. Yeah, in, in terms How was of- that, good? That was, that was really great. I think we, Thanks. we could probably shut the show down. Yeah, right? we're done now. I guess we, we could go through some He's of got the supporting- He's got some backup info. Yeah, some of the supporting documentation. Um, beer is losing share, has been losing share. That's something that we've talked about. I think we settled in the last quarter on maybe a beer would just be flat, meaning no growth. Right. However, that analysis has shifted to beer is going to 
negatively grow, <laughs> which is not growing. It's it's in decline. That slide I'm looking at right now says that since 2012, beer was 57, 52 percent, 52 percent of total share, and now it's 45. So in that 11 year period, it's gone down. Yes, um, even though craft was continually growing through that whole thing. Yes, the sub premium brands were losing share the whole time. And everyone knows like, oh my God, Miller Lite is down 10%, down 10% every quarter, right? Right. Or so, the other ones too, but. So you have to. That's a premium brand, not you have, premium, sorry. For this, um, for this to make a, any sense is you have to let go of anecdotes about people are drinking less because of health reasons or people are drinking or, or, or new consumers are, are, are not drinking um, they might be drinking less, but in the aggregate, mm -hmm. the amount of ethanol, that means alcohol for beer, wine, or spirits has been at a constant 2.5 gallons per consumer per year. And that 65% of legal drinking age Americans drink. Right. In varying amounts. Right. But they average out to 2.5 gallons per year per 65 per 300. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Legal drinking age is like 217 million. Seems low. I don't know. Here I am drinking out of a can when I have a glass. Anyway, yes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that you have to start with that basis. It's not health. It's not we're stopping drinking. It's just that we're trading beer share of throat to. Right. It's not also cost, by the way. It's not cost. Uh, although people may trade, um, people may trade for lower cost options. The volume remains the same. And so if you know that, um, that's actually um, okay uh, because these other things are harder to control. So people are substituting. Um, so, so beer really was part of the flavor revolution. You talk about a product that had one dimension back in the 70s. And because of things like the slow food movement, uh, we got away from grocery stores just giving you one kind of bread and they started to give you like, I don't know, you go to the grocery store, how many different kinds of breads are you see in the bread aisle? Um, you know, five dozen, maybe four dozen types of many things in a, in a, in a, you know, like I'm not even talking about the bakery stuff or rolls. There's Holy a lot of facing five grain, seven grain, 12 grain. <laughs> right. But all manner of white bread. I mean, you can get the, uh, you don't get the soft wonder bread. You can get the farmers uh, farm. Yeah. The, uh, potato, uh, sure. all kinds of stuff, right? It's white bread, but different. Um, but as part of the whole Alice waters restaurant thing where, and, and, and it started to become that consumers were telling grocery stores, restaurant tours, we want other things. We don't want the same things. And beer is beer, craft beer in particular has been a part of that. Um, changing the, mono um, style of- Flavor cravers. Of, of Pilsner to, to different things. So um, those things were um, um, a natural part of um, craft brewing. They turn out, they are labor intensive. Uh, a bunch of larger brewing entities thought they could just purchase them and, and, and streamline and do what they do best and cut costs and um, leverage the- uh, 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 distribution network that they had largely created and controlled and excluded through laws and lots of cash. Um, they thought they could capture that. Uh, to some degree, they were successful, to, but in, in the aggregate now, they're they're dumping those brands, right? They're, they're saying, you know what? Um, we're going to go back to this other thing. And they're reselling those brands or they're discontinuing lines. Anchor, probably going to be discontinued, maybe not, uh, or sold, Ballast Point, so, they were purchased for a billion dollars and they were sold for what? 10 million. Ten, <laughs> something like no, that. No, 100 million. 30. It was, I don't know. It Pennies it was, on the dollar. Yeah, pennies on the dollar for sure. So um, now what we're seeing is uh, people still want those flavors. They're getting them from things like RTDs, seltzer. Uh, and those things without the history and the... Um, the uh, value on provenance, where it's from, who makes it, story, are able to sort of break through that um, resistance. And so we still have 
a lot of flavorful products. We still have, and, and you know, like with our beer experience, we kind of went to the extreme, you know, people were putting, you know, raw cookie dough and stuff and things <laughs> like, right. But I mean, that hasn't really necessarily stopped. You, I mean, get, what are you drinking right now? I'm drinking a, a pineapple mango goza. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean. Um, and that's not crazy, but it's not definitely not something you would have seen 10 years ago, even N no. maybe 15. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's not, um, it's not, you know, um, uh, what, what, uh, it's not spree candies or you, 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 ramen noodles uh, in soup. I, yeah. I mean, in beer, I've seen ramen noodles in beer. Um, you, you, you do see that you Glitter see the, beer, you see the Arby's collaboration with a vodka maker. You see, so, you know, they're still doing that stuff. Um, so we a took Velveeta it. cheese with, um, <laughs> gosh, what was that? That was vodka too. Of course, vodka, yeah. <laughs> vodka carries the flavor. Right. Um, so that's where the competition is. Um, one of the, th one of the stats I saw on Thanksgiving weekend is beer was up slightly, but craft beer was not. It was, it was, it was low. It was, um, sub pre some premium lagers. So think about your PBRs and, 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 um, hams, right? Uh, that was a big seller on the Wednesday be before Thanksgiving and also seltzers, which, you know, kind of have plateaued and started to come down. But on that day, people are thinking, oh, I'm not going to get, I'm going to eat a bunch of food tomorrow. So I can't drink something really highly filling or cal caloric, even though uh, you may not have any of those savings. It's all super psychological, right? Like, I'm Or they're saying, I'm going to my mom's house and everyone else drinks right hams or the or part of the family wants to have seltzer so i'm just going to get that and i'm just going to be okay with that i guess yes but that's how they're all consuming their 2.5 gallons of ethanol mm -hmm. so sort of doing it differently so what's what's different about that how can how can we win um um and uh, we'll get into that a little creating bit, more occasions yeah oh, did i did i go ahead of the game right ahead sorry but sorry uh but one of the um I, See if I can find the slide and put it up, but um, uh, we do know that inventories uh, uh, people people were producing more volume than people were eventually buying, and that had that's sort of self corrected. Um, uh, but there is a uh, figure in here about um, keg volume. There we mm, go. That's a rough one. This one is a that this is one's, a hard one. So um, I'm looking at a graph. If you're if you're watching online, you'll be able to see it. Uh, if you're not, I'm looking at a graph where you've got 20, 20, 20 million units uh, of kegs, right? Consistently from what is this? Twenty ten to twenty fifteen uh, at that level, and from twenty fifteen on, um, and there's a there's a blip, you know, for the pandemic in twenty twenty. But that trend line has gone down, and so in twenty twenty three, um, you're looking at a hundred and thirty, or so thirteen, or excuse me, thirteen million barrels. Starting kegs. in twenty fifteen, yeah. keg volume begins to decrease. Yes, and then it takes a huge hit in twenty twenty. Falls off a cliff, but it it does come back but it doesn't come back to that trend line that started in 2015. It's it's the proverbial dead cat bounce. It goes down, yes. it, it fell, bounced, and has continued to fall after that bounce yeah. in, in 2022. I mean, a dead cat bounce would push it up higher. No, it-, it, it Whatever, it's fine. It's I don't dead, know why so we're it, arguing about it, this. It falls again. Okay, yes. Um, and it's- So um, we're even below that trend line. And yeah. uh, the question is why? Uh, restaurants have come back. They're back to the same number and the same dollars as they had been prior to the uh, pandemic. And kegs are not making a recovery. They're still going down faster than they were before. Right. And my initial thought is there's a lot of craft breweries who didn't bring salespeople back after pandemic. That is part of it for sure. Um, so, are we pushing it as hard as we could be? <clears throat> well, that's an open consumers question. Consumers draw, right? Consumers right. pull the beer, right? Even whether it's at a restaurant or in a grocery store, consumers are pulling. You cannot sell more than consumers pull. Well, I mean, you can, but we know how that goes. 
Um, the 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 other source of this is um, did and will retailers who have thirty draft systems fill those thirty keg lines, or, or will, they, will they just be like eh, or, ten's or, good? Or they they might just pull them. When We've they pull them, absolutely lost total number of tap handles have gone down. Yeah, and so when they're pulled, um, what happens? And then you know if you had the, the if you had the the guy with three taps or six taps and, and it's all in one unit. Um, and he just pulls that out because, um, we're just going to switch the package. Um, we know that when they switch the package, the volume's not going to be there. And those, uh, package sale, those package offerings more traditionally go to large producers, not craft producers, right? Especially self-distributed craft producers lose out on that entire account. Right. Like if you like self-distributed craft producers are able to, deliver kegs way more easily than they can deliver package at a rel- at a better profit margin as well. Right. And you, of course you see keg wine once in a while and you see cider and, and meat and kegs, but it is dominated by draft. Like there were no, um, there was no movement or press to put RTDs in, into, um, on draft. There's no. And A's. And, and, or, or, um, you know, you don't see white claw on draft, right? Um, not that it's not possible. It just wasn't something that was They part did of a little experiment, but it didn't really. Right. People want that can in their hand. It, it, it matters. Format matters. So when they, when they, um, when they pull these out and they, and they, bless you, we don't have a sneeze button. Uh, it, 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 when they pull those out and they go to package goods, that is where the people who, again, the flavor, you want flavor? We got all kinds of flavor. They're in cans. Right. And that's where a lot of beer will lose. Yep. Um, because, uh, craft breweries are built for kegs. They're just not built for package. Even if you add on package, it's an add on and it's way more expensive than putting beer in kegs. People will also be very selective about what beer they choose. You, you know, you don't get the classic, I'll have an IPA bar call, but you might have, Hey, you got any flavored seltzer and they'll just give you something and you'll just be great. They might say cherry or, or, or whatever. You're, you're not as brand conscious, like you're just going to probably take it. Yeah. Um, so it's a different dynamic and that's, that is the substitute. That's an example of the substitution going on. So one place that kegs have remained strong. Yes. Is at breweries in the tap room. Yes. So the brewery channel, uh, and, and this is somewhat of a quote remains steady and visitors have increased according to the BA's Harris poll of survey respondents who drink craft a few times a year, 69% said they had visited brewery in the last year, a 3% increase. So that is where people are preferring to have draft. They're preferring to visit breweries and it is increasing. And that's been steadily increasing since all of this lost keg volume stuff happened. But even throughout the pandemic, it continued increasing because they would go to the tap rooms more often and right. that's making that point that having an experience at your tap room means people i mean if you look and say hey have you been to a brewery in the last 12 months yes okay well great how many times oh well five times oh 10 times oh 25 times oh 187 times if you're me <laughs> but um, getting those repeat customers, everyone knows this. This is like brewery tap room slash restaurant 101. Recurring customers are your bread and butter, not those group on people who come in and try it once. Right. Um, that's great for the overall industry is that people are interested in finding new things. But for your business, getting those repeats, everyone knows that's a critical part. Right. I don't know what my point was. No. So... Um, uh, I, I mean, it, the the point is that's where the value for our breweries is. That's that's where, it, as a consumer, you can you can provide value to breweries that you support. Um, we should note that uh, there were 385 closings and 420 openings, so it, it's not upside down yet. We haven't seen the massive closures, but this is definitely we are ready for next year to be the point where that could cross over um, closings exceed openings but uh two things one and it's that the high watermark was 1200 breweries being opened in a year wow um with very few closures but um 
Uh, As we've seen here, and we've heard from our peers, when breweries are closing, another brewery is taking that space over. Yeah. And that doesn't count as a new brewery opening. So even though it counts as a closing, yes, it's not like closing. And there's no way in the stats that really gets caught up because that location remains a brewery. It's just a different brewery that had already been opened. Right. Many, many times, not every time, obviously, but uh, it's hard for that stuff, that data to really get in there. Right. But as closures and openings sort of cross over or remain integrated or, or correlated with each other, not correlated. Yeah. Um, yeah, correlated. Um, that's a sign of a, a mature market. You have people coming in, you have people leaving. And that's the hospitality industry in general. And Bart Watson pointed out that closures are higher in more mature markets, such as Colorado and parts of California. And this amount of churn is normal in the hospitality industry. So uh, again, we need to take our keys from the hospitality industry and uh, understand that this is a natural process. And you know, the, the, the people who get it are going to survive and the people who, and who want to remain, because there are people who are going to not want to remain, even if they understand exactly what they need to do. We, we have most of our breweries approaching the eight year mark. Some are older, fewer are younger. Uh, a lot happens in eight years. I mean, your, your own son became the adult man when he was the boy <laughs> child. Uh, he's 21 now, right? Well, not only that, but a lot of 10 year leases are gonna start coming up like any day because right. that build out took a lot longer than you thought. And instead of taking the three months that you had free rent, it took six or nine months. And now uh, your 10 year anniversary is coming up, even though you've only been open eight years or nine years and you have to make a decision. Am I willing to take that higher rent? Is my business going to be able to sustain that or is it just too much work and I'm going to do something else instead? Agree. Um, that is something that we need to be conscious of. There's a couple other takeaways. Um, one of them is when you look at these large numbers, understand that sometimes one or two companies are driving these numbers. Ah. So um, as a style, one of the most popular styles right now is um, hazy double IPA. Quote popular. Well, I mean, it you drives mean in package, right? Yeah, package. Um, but that is largely driven by one entity. You know what that one that is? That is uh, New Belgium's voodoo stuff. <laughs> Ranger. <laughs> voodoo stuff. <laughs> yeah. That is driving those sales. Con consumer, or excuse me, um, convenience store sales, 19.2 cans. So volume and, and sales. That 9% hazy IPA they sell in 19.2 cans is enough to change the entire data set on beer. Yeah. That's how much of it they sell. It's wild. Yeah. So when you see that, oh, this is trending, does that mean as a brewery that's something you should hop on? Not clear. If, it's not clear to me that. Well, they said if you take out that one mm -hmm. skew, it, it's a negative. It's, in, it's negative that actually double IPAs are down. Imperials are down in total sales, yeah. except for that one skew. Right. Nevertheless, it's it, you shouldn't be doing it just because the numbers are up. You should be doing it for other reasons. If you decide that that's the direction you go, maybe in your because of the of the customers you've cultivated, maybe it's a great thing. To sure. Do. Um, the other one is non elk non elks, so uh, non alcohol, um, largely been driven by Athletic, um, maybe Partake, a few, maybe a few other brands. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Sierra they're, Nevada's they're, jumping into that game right now. Yes, and there are technical reasons why that's not an easy switchover for breweries, uh, pasteurization, um, things like that. Uh, uh, management of of your supply chain, all that stuff is is much more difficult for a small brewery. Plus, there are some regulatory hurdles that you need to be aware of, um, like putting your FDA info on the can. But the overall, yes, uh, the overall message is those are two products that were placed into people people's hands who may not have been traditional drinkers of these products before. And it's all about flavor again. So it's it's about yeah, it's about flavor, uh, creating occasions. Um, so uh, you know, different styles, uh, 
might attract different people. Um, non-alcohol um, attracts people. Uh, we just read this morning, um, what is it, that uh, uh, 60, no, 90, 93% of people who purchase non-alcs also produce or also purchase alcohol. Right. And of those that do so, actually buy more. So if you're a if you're a consumer of both non-elk and elk products, you are probably drinking more than most people who just drink alcohol. Oh hi, it's me. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? I also drink non-elk <laughs> and more than the average, I'm sure. I mean two point five gallons a year, that's child's play. <laughs> yeah. Speaking yeah. of which, that's what? for you. Okay. Is this an impromptu pause? I think uh, I don't. I need you by my side to talk. I don't know why. I. It's well. I don't know. It's, I'm. I'm. I'm just bloviating. I'm. I'm. Um. Yeah. Yeah. What right, is going on? Break. Yeah, it's a break. It's a break, but we're almost done, I think. We just need to land the plane. Uh, okay. What is that? That's the nutritional information. Uh, it's not in the right format, though, is it? Partake pan. Can. Absolutely, it is. I thought it had to be in that square. No. If it's not even in that square on... It doesn't have to be in that square on everything. Hmm? All no. Right. No. I mean, you've seen that before. Have you seen a cereal box where you have to read and be like, oh, oh, no, cereal bars. So like right. granola bars? Yeah. You're reading it. It's in that. No, I thought for beverages it had to be in that oh. rectangle with the big for zero. beverages. Hmm. I don't think that's a thing. I don't know. I don't know anything. <laughs> well, so let me, I mean, we're going to talk about beers. Let's hang on a minute before we do that. Because I think what the takeaway here is, the overall takeaway is, um, if you are a fan of a brewery, again, your best purchase, your most impactful purchase is in the tap room, right? Bar none. Breweries have to be better at attracting, retaining, and creating long-term customers. And that is what hospitality does. That's what hospitality industry uh, teachings uh, will help with. That is... That is the direction forward for a, a tourism state that has many events uh, throughout the year that bring in influxes of customers who, you know, are not repeat. But the tourism uh, sentiment of Arizona is we want to repeat bring, bringing people in for different occasions. Uh, it's creating more occasions either through new products that you don't normally carry, uh, having a wider range of products. So, again, if you're a taproom brewery, maybe that is spending the money to get a six or a seven um, to attract more people. Um, and I'll bring it to a very personal thing for the guild. That means uh, showcasing your products at one of our festivals and can, and, and with the, if, hey, we already do that. We already there. Literally asking people, have you been to our brewery? Why haven't you been to our brewery? How can, have, you know, like, did you know that we offer these things at our brewery? Um, we have tours or next time you come in, take this card. You've done this. You know, if I'm around, I'll buy you a beer or whatever it every takes. Every time I went to an event, every beer had a card and every person who ordered that beer took the card in their hand before I would give them their sample. Yeah. And then they shoved it in their pocket. It's fine. So the next day they see it. We are seeing, um, we are seeing a lot of people who produce NA beverages having a really high interest in attending our Strong Beer Festival. That should tell you something right now. That is something that we sort of put our heads together and, and talked about this morning, and it relates to exactly what we've been talking about. Um, there's also a lot of interest from out-of-state breweries to showcase products, and the question is uh, whether they will be able to um, attract interest. As an Arizona brewery, you have a place for them to go, and it is the best place for you to send them. Like if I have, uh, you know, I have this beer from, you know, Vermont and I'm there and like, you know, I got to tell you the four retailers and the value that they got to go to, like less likely to happen unless they have a personal connection to Vermont. Right. They have a personal connection to you because you literally own the place or you literally work at that place or. Um, and you're there standing you're, in the booth. Yes. And, and, and you can 
tell them where to stay. You, if you're from out of town, you can tell them where to eat. You can tell them the another the breweries that you like to go to that are nearby. That is the advantage that you need to take to heart, and 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 that's why festivals are important. If you want to make them important, you don't have to do them. We have people who whose circumstances it doesn't make a lot of sense, and we understand that. If you're gonna be there. You need to take the information that we've given you and and consider it because these trends, um, all these trends are actually, the negative trends are somewhat in your favor if you can bring people to your place. That's right. There are plenty of brew festivals that have decided not to continue existing. Um, and we work hard to make sure we have that opportunity for our breweries. And yes, it is a huge fundraiser for us but it is also it's not just a fundraiser designed. it is a way that it, it's it's it, it is a fundraiser but it's not like we're sitting on banks of money it is to fund the operation yeah so it's designed to also make sure that our breweries have the opportunity of the best best chance for people to come to their space so um, without an organization like this, and there could be a different one, you know, somewhere in the future of beer in Arizona, I mean, there might be other, uh, a lot of uh, more restaurant focus, people can lean on the restaurant association to carry their ideas and their bills forward. But like this is the, this remains the only organization that legislates, creates policy, creates the most favorable conditions for breweries to exist. And that's why it's important for people to support it. Or not make it really easy for us. Don't you know, like you know, uh, um, it, it's a model that's criticized a lot. The, the festival model, um, great. Let's have another model. Let's figure out some other way. But right now, that's that's the vehicle, and we're telling you why this makes sense. I hope so. Let's <laughs> let's drink some beer because, like, I I'd, I'd like to just drink some beer right, now I and hear saison. Oh, I, I know saison you I, last night. All right. Well, we have got a lot of glasses here, and I got. I think that I finished your. Um, oh, okay, great. Your fire oh. and fury, yeah, and Kitsune, fire rises. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. It's very. That is in my jam. It's really got nice, a nice, right? It's got a hop um, malt thing going on that I don't know if I have. I can't really. It's earthy, earthy maybe. I don't know what hops are used in that, but. Well, I just opened and poured rye in the hood. This is a collab between Old Ellsworth and Uncle Bear's Brewery. Oh, this is, I didn't want to open this one. Why? Because this is when this one's uh, pretty rare, right? Or do they reissue this? This is a award winner. That is an award winner. Did they come out with it again or we just found some more cans? I went to the brewery on Sunday after we got back from Flagstaff and I bought some. Oh, so it is, they rebrewed it. They, they rebrewed still have some. Oh, well, they still or have some. Or maybe they we don't more. Know. I don't know. Well, it was a hard beer to get for a while. People wanted it. Yeah. So thank you. I'm going to drink this out of the can because I still have this mango thing going on. <laughs> Pineapple mango. So this is the award-winning um, Saison with blueberry. Yes, or blackberry. Um, Some sort of berry. Yeah, blueberry. Maybe. I don't know. I think it's just a Saison this time. No, there's a there's a berry. Blueberry then, yeah. Blueberry, yeah. Slight berry. It says boop right there. And this is also a collab with L. Ellsworth. Yes. Yes. French Cezanne with blueberry juices. And something I can't read. Blackberry. Something. <laughs> it's freaking great. Yeah. Delicious. What else we got going on? We have our legislative agenda meeting this afternoon. So, and then that is with a bonus happy hour afterwards. So we Christmas party for the uh, legislative agenda people to hang out and chat. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how much we've revealed about what we're doing. I probably won't say too much other than in general, in general, um, we are looking at ways for smaller breweries to scale up partner brewing um, with larger breweries 
in a way that makes sense. Um, uh, so if you are a guild member, uh, reach out to us if you'd like further details. If you are a beer fan or someone that is not a guild member, uh, we will have more information if and when the uh, legislative agenda moves forward. If Correct. it doesn't move forward, then there's no need for you to worry about it. And we'll probably launch it again, figure out a little different take on it. Yeah. Uh, there you go. We're, Did that we're help? Looking at, yeah, we're looking at a specific set of, of language and a direction, but there, there, there's going to be a rewrite of it no matter what tomorrow when um, some of our other uh, friends actually uh, weigh in. And it, so I don't want to say too much about it. Um, the best thing you can do is just be at the ready in case we need it. Uh, and when you say be at the ready, what you mean is if we get this moving forward and we need legislative support that you can reach out to your legislators from your district to help us. And whether that be your business district or your home district where you vote, if they're different things, both, then we need you to reach out to those legislators to get them to vote. Yes. The, yeah. So the, the goal is to get what we need uh, done without any other outside intervention at all yep. because it makes sense. We write a deal that makes sense and everybody agrees. That's fine. Um, and then if, it makes if, it really if, easy and you don't have to do anything. Right. And if, in, in, you know, and there's kind of a, you know, a thing that we say, if you're testifying, you're losing. If you're having to explain uh, in front of the legislature why this is needed, then you're, you're, you need that statement piece to work and you're, you're already losing potentially. Um, not that it is important, not, not that we haven't used it. It's just, um, um, in this case, we don't feel like the pushback is from going to be from the legislature. We just need to sort out some details. Um, and when you're negotiating, you just don't say that publicly, what you're going to do or why. So hopefully we'll have a good, I, I don't expect anything to get done today. I don't expect anything to get done, uh, uh, even next month, potentially, um, when the session starts, I think we January just want January eighth. We brand just want new legislative session. We just want our our language to continue to be involved in the process and be a placeholder until such time that we get agreement. And if we don't get agreement, then we can decide whether to run it outside of this process. And then maybe we'll have a different take on this. But for now, just know that we're trying to uh, give our breweries an opportunity to participate in channels that they're normally not um, involved in. And, and, and um, I think there's some great future. It's, it's consistent with our, our, will, uh, our, our, our want to provide more tools in the retail space. It's consistent with uh, us freeing up language so that breweries and distilleries and wineries can work together. Um, we're, here to, we're here to give them as many tools as possible because uh, uh, I think because they're involved in manufacturing, our guys, uh, restaurants, um, they make products um, that are enjoyed by the other phases, distilling and, and wine, um, because they, we're the uh, we're kind of the tip of the spear, and, and we, we, we're retailers and we're uh, suppliers of, of, of products and also distribute. Our success means that other phases are succeeding as well. Can I say all that tomorrow <laughs> or today, later this afternoon? I Maybe. hope so. That was, that was beautiful. Uh, yeah, there are some technicalities that <clears throat> we want to fix, I guess, or change, or I don't know. Um, we're doing a, we're doing the work. Our breweries. <laughs> we're it, we're, it, we're to, doing things in the last fifteen years. Twenty years. I have years. to get two in the weeds to get any further out. Uh, we're just doing things in the last 10 or 15 years that um, the rest of the industry took hundreds of years to to do. I mean, if you, yeah. And the, the common thing is to say, look at why does wine get direct ship? And then we reply with, well, they worked on it for 30 years and they got direct ship. And we've done things that we do in five years that are equivalent to the things that they achieve in 30 years. So it's great. Next, I'm not doing this. I don't know why years. I'm defending myself. <laughs> I don't know, man. Let's get out of here because I got to right. edit this thing. And um, uh, for everybody listening, I hope you have a, a Merry Christmas yeah. and celebrate um, according to your beliefs. Uh, and uh, hopefully 
we'll talk to you next year and, and we'll have some good news. Uh, we have the Craig Miller interview coming up. Yeah. Um, that will be released. Uh, and then we're going to probably try to get as many guests in between now and, and beer week, I think that'd be the goal. Yeah. Let's get some content. I already have some up here. Right on. Uh, also visit the church of awesome.net. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you mean? can celebrate the feast of mirth and chosen family. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, uh, <laughs> you created your own <laughs> I did. church so that you could yes. marry people uh, or just because, just because oh, I have a friend in San Diego and we're like, this is awesome. We should have a church of awesome. I am a, I'm a do this priest so I can use that credential to marry people in mm-hmm. Arizona. Although I, I probably don't want to do anyone's just anyone's way <laughs> and everybody I know is already where they want to be on that scale. Probably everybody. Uh, That's everybody, wild. Yeah, uh-huh. everybody that I would perform a service for, where sure. I could say sure. talk about their childhood and all that other stuff. Oh my! Well, you know, whatever. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to like. I want to have a good batting record, man. If I marry sure um, keep it, keep it together, just like the guild. We have yeah. a great record with our one couple. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Chuck Nall married that person. True fact. At Strong Beer, we had a wedding. Um, they're still married. Let's refer to it as Arizona Strong, please. Yes. Thank you. All right. We're done talking. We gotta be done talking. <laughs> All right, we're done talking. All right. It is not a beer podcast. It's a podcast about beer, and sometimes the beer finds you. Here we are. Beer found us. Getting ready Cheers. for Christmas. Cheers.